Atomic Orbital Hybridization. In this video, we are going to be explaining where hybrid orbitals come from, naming them, figuring out which leftover, or leftover orbitals there are for each type of hybridization, and determining the hybridization for given atoms within a molecule. We have our two models of bonding, so let's review these. First, we have valence bond theory, which we'll be talking about in this podcast, which includes hybridization. And in this case, atoms are going to retain their own orbitals, but overlapping orbitals form our bonds. The other option is molecular orbital theory. And in this case, our atomic orbitals are combining, and those make these new molecular orbitals, which then form our bonds. Our first theory or model here is simpler. It's faster, but it's also less accurate. And in a perfect world, we get to use MO theory or even more complex ones all the time. But this valence bond theory works well enough that oftentimes we'll just want to be able to use that since it's so much easier. So let's first summarize what's happening. We're combining valence orbitals to make new orbitals that stay within an atom. And these have names that are based on the orbitals that they come from. So if you combine an S orbital and a P orbital, you get, a new, you get sp orbitals. If you combine one s orbital and two p orbitals, you get sp2 orbitals, and so on and so forth. And we'll talk about each of these individually here in a second. The number of new orbitals that you create, which we'll talk about in a moment, are it's what is going to give you the Vesper geometries that we've already talked about. So these make up your Vesper geometries. Any p orbitals that you don't use to make hybrid orbitals still exist. Those can sometimes be empty, and they can sometimes be used to form a different kind of bond. Let's take a look at one of these. So first, we're going to talk about sp hybridization. In this case, we'll take our s orbital, and we'll take one of our p orbitals and combine them. So here, we took our s orbital, and we took one of our p orbitals and we combine them to make a new set of hybrid orbitals. And I've shown this here in purple and blue. Each of those is an sp orbital. So now we have two of them. I color coded them for ease. Since this actually is overlapping a bit in the picture and you can't see it, I pulled it out here so that you could see what it looks like when they're not overlapping. So you see that you get something that looks like it's halfway between an s and a p orbital. It's not quite an s orbital, it's not quite a p orbital. We started with two orbitals, an s orbital and one p orbital, and we ended with two different sp orbitals. So however many orbitals you start the hybridization process with, you come out with that many hybrid orbitals. This is one way of looking at it, and we're gonna go through all of the types of hybridization in this manner, but I also wanna talk about energy levels. One more note, notice how these are arranged we have two hybrid orbitals, they're going to be as far apart from each other as possible, and this means that two hybrid orbitals as far apart as possible is a 180 degree angle, and that's a linear molecule. Now let's talk about what this looks like with hybridization and energy levels. So we're still going to be looking at sp, and we'll move on after this. We draw our energy level diagrams for our valence shell like this. I didn't put numbers next to it, just to keep it general. For an sp hybridization, we're going to be taking our one, one of our s's and one of our p's and combining those. We saw the picture of what that looks like on the previous slide, but if we want to look at the energy levels, what happens is this becomes somewhere in between an s and a p orbital. So I've drawn that here where you can see it's higher than an s but lower than a p. We started with two orbitals, we get two orbitals. They're named after the orbitals that they come from, so s and p. That's the name of the orbital, just like before over here, we called this an s orbital, and we called this a p orbital. And the energy is somewhat between the two that it came from. So it's just another way of looking at the exact same thing. Now we're going to go through and do this for sp2 and sp3 orbitals as well. So here we're looking at sp2, which means that we have two p orbitals that are being combined now. 
So when we combine this, we started with three orbitals. We're going to end with three orbitals, and they're going to be called sp2. So we started with one of our s's and two of our p's. In this case, I used the blue and the green. And we made three new orbitals that look somewhat between an s and a p. So it's not quite an s, it's not quite a p. We started with three, we get three. One, two, three. And because we need to spread these out in equal distance from each other, they're all gonna be 120 degree angles from each other, and we know that that's a trigonal planar geometry. Or bent if one of them is a lone pair. Now let's look at this in terms of energy levels. Once again, we draw our valence shell. Once again, I didn't use numbers to keep it general. We're doing sp2. So we'll circle the ones that we're going to combine. We start with three orbitals. So we're going to end with three orbitals. They're going to come from the name of the orbitals that they were originally from. So we used an s and we used two p's. And we get three sp2 orbitals. We started with three, we end with three. Just like before, we have a leftover p orbital, in this case just one though, and so that stays where it is. Just a different way of looking at it than the previous slide. So once again, we combine three orbitals to get three new orbitals. Because we combined an s in two different p orbitals, we use the name sp2 that describes what type of orbitals they are. And this is the name of the orbital, exactly like the s and p orbitals were. So after these are hybridized, we no longer have an s orbital, and we only have one p orbital, but we have three sp2 orbitals. The energy of these hybrid orbitals are somewhere in between the initial orbitals. So once again, higher than an s orbital, lower than a p orbital. Let's move on to sp3 and do the exact same thing. Now we're taking all of our p orbitals. We're taking all three and we're combining them with our s orbital. So all of these orbitals are going to be used up. And these also look very much in between an s and a p orbital. Now this gets a little messy to draw and you'll generally see them drawn with just one lobe of each drawn. So like this, even though they do actually have two lobes, so keep that in mind. Um, they do have the two lobes, but you'll almost always see them drawn with just the one because it gets really messy otherwise. So these do still look like something that comes from an s orbital combining with three p orbitals. They have a much higher percentage of looking like p orbitals though. You can see they almost look the same if you were to draw up the other lobe. And we have four orbitals all in different directions. So this is a tetrahedral. Let's look at this in terms of energy levels. Now we're combining all of our valence S and P orbitals. Could we take all four and we make four new orbitals. We start with four, we end with four. They're named after the thing that they came from. They're named after these orbitals. And so it's called S, P, three, because you're taking three orbitals. S, P, three, because you're taking three P orbitals. And now notice there's no leftover P orbitals. All of our P orbitals have been used up and we just have our four S, P, three orbitals. So things to notice. We combined four orbitals to get four new orbitals. We combined an s and three p orbitals, so we named this sp3. And the energies of these is between your s orbital and your p orbital. But notice it's now much closer to p than the previous ones, because there's more p orbitals creating the new hybrid orbitals. We can keep going with this and go up to D2. So the same thing happens for sp3d and sp3d2 orbitals. Just like the other situations, we start with, in this case, five orbitals. So we make 
five new orbitals. One, two, three, four, five. And we end up with our trigonal bipyramidal structure. Or for sp3d2, we start with six orbitals. So we make six new orbitals. And of course, we know that a situation where we have six orbitals equidistant apart from each other is an octahedral electron geometry. We're not going to go through these in, in dramatic detail because you can kind of pick up the pattern. If you have more questions about it, you can always come ask me in office hours. Now, you have to have this in the backdrop of your memory when you go to solve these problems. You need to, you need to know what they look like. You need to be able to think about where they came from. You need to know all of that. However, that's not how you're actually going to go about deciding the hybridization because you want to be able to do this much quicker. So first off, we're going to draw our Lewis structure. And this just sets us up so that we know how many bonds there are, what types of bonds there are to each atom. It lets us figure out our arrangement of our electron pairs in our bonds. And this will let us figure out the hybridization for each atom much quickly, much more quickly. Also remember that each atom has its own hybridization. Now, from this Lewis structure, you're going to determine your steric number. So remember, your steric number is how many bonded atoms you have. Not how many bonds, but how many bonded atoms. And your number of lone pairs. This tells you how many hybrid orbitals you need. So once you find your steric number, you know how many hybrid orbitals you need. And you can match it up. If you need two, you know that you need an sp hybridization. If you need three, you need an sp2. If you need four, you need sp3. If you need five, you need sp3d. If you need six, you need sp3d2. And you could memorize this if you really wanted to, I wouldn't suggest it, because you can tell how many orbitals you have and how many you get just by counting up the orbitals and the hybrid orbitals. So for two, you can see that we have an S and a P, so that's one, one equals two. And that's what I have drawn off here. I'm just counting up the number of orbitals. So let's look at six. This is from an S, this is from a P, and this is from your Ds, they add up to be six. So this is the much faster way of doing it and how we're going to actually do it. Um, after we do some practice doing this, it's probably worthwhile to watch this video again, uh, maybe on double speed this time, to get the beginning part again. Uh, but remember, this is how we actually go about figuring out the hybridization. So let's look at some examples. Now let's do some examples. The first one's a little bit of a trick because we haven't talked about this yet. If something is only bonded to one atom, there's no reason to hybridize it. You could. Hybridization that allows for a little flexibility here, but you don't have to. And so for something like N2, we can say each nitrogen is only bonded to one thing, and so it's not going to be hybridized. And that's a perfectly fine answer. Now let's go on to some real ones. Here we have AlH3. So let's just look at our central atom, since our hydrogens aren't going to be hybridizing. Let's figure out its steric number. Its steric number is its number of bonds and its number of lone pairs. So we have three bonds, zero lone pairs, which gives us a steric number of three. If we either look back at our chart or think about how many orbitals we need to make this happen, that's going to be an S and then two p orbitals. So we have one plus two equals three. So it's sp2 hybridized. Let's look at another. Here we have ammonia. So we look at its steric number and we have one, two, three bonds and one lone pair. So its steric number is gonna be four. And if we start counting up the orbitals we need, that means we have an s orbital, and we need three p orbitals, which gives us sp3 hybridized. And we know that because of our steric number. A couple more. 
Here we have POCl3. We are again going to look at its steric number. So we have one, two, three, four bonded atoms. Remember, when we're counting steric number, our double bond counts as one. So our steric number equals four. And just like before, that means when we start counting orbitals, we'll have an s orbital, and we're going to need to get three p orbitals to add everything up, leaving us with sp3 hybridization. Now let's do some examples with our higher steric numbers. So let's look at steric number six. I, I told you that this was steric number six, but let's walk through figuring that out just in case. So we have one bond, two bond, three bond, four bond, plus two lone pairs to give us a steric number of six. We need our orbitals to add up to six. So we have an S, and if we use our three P orbitals, we're still only at four, so we need two more. This means that it, we must be sp3d2. So we have a steric number of six. We need six initial orbitals to form our hybrid orbitals. So we use an S, we use up all of our P's, and we still need two more, and so we get d2. Next one. This is similar, except we only have one lone pair. So we count up our steric number. We have our steric number six. We count up our orbitals. If we use all of our p orbitals, we're still only at four. And so we need to add two d orbitals to it. And we're at sp3d2 again. So we've talked about where hybrid orbitals come from. We've named our hybrid orbitals. We've looked at how there's leftover p orbitals for each type of hybridization. And we're going to be doing a lot more with this later on. I know here we just kind of said, OK, there's some leftover p orbitals. They do some things. We'll talk about that in more detail in the following videos. And we talked about the hybridization for atoms within given molecules. Now, in our case, we kept it kind of simple, and we only had one central atom. But remember that we can do this for any atom. in larger molecules. And we'll do some example of that later on too.